just days ahead of Pope Francis's visit to Peru, a giant Christ statue in the capital, donated by the Brazilian construction company at the center of Latin America's largest corruption scandal, was damaged in a fire. Francis is Latin America's first pope, but he will not be visiting his home, Argentina, to avoid embroilment in domestic politics there. On his Peruvian agenda is protecting the Amazon, but Peruvians will be paying close attention to whether or not he addresses corruption, a topic Francis frequently rails against. Four churches were also attacked with homemade bombs that inflicted only minor damage, while notes threatening the Pope were left behind. During the Pope's visit, protests are expected on issues ranging from indigenous rights to an ongoing sexual abuse scandal in the church. The capital, Lima, is busy putting the final touches on preparations for the visit, which begins on Monday. Japan has summoned China's ambassador after a Chinese Navy vessel was spotted near islands controlled by Japan, but also claimed by China. The uninhabited Senkaku Islands are administered by Japan, but China also claims ownership of the islands, which they call the Diaoyu Islands. Japan said a Chinese frigate was spotted in the waters off the Senkakus on January 11th. They also said a submarine of unconfirmed nationality was spotted. However, China's foreign ministry spokesman said Thursday the islands are China's sovereign territory. He added that the Navy had been tracking two Japanese ships that had crossed into Chinese territory. However, he also expressed hopes that bilateral relations would improve. The maritime dispute comes as the two countries are trying to mend relations that have been icy since the Second World War. Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Koro is reportedly planning to visit China later this month to further improve relations. For United News International, I'm Matt Paul. The U.S. Navy's littoral combat ships have been repeatedly criticized for its lack of firepower and numerous mechanical failures. They cost more than twice as much as promised and require 75% more crew to operate than planned for, wrote Sebastian Roblin recently. Mission modules that could be applied to each individual LCS for specific roles have been delayed. The Navy has defended the LCS in the past and it looks like they may finally catch a break. The modules will reportedly have operational capacity or be in the operational testing phase in the next three years. Parts of California's Santa Barbara County were being scoured on Saturday by a massive influx of search and rescue crews as seven people remain missing following mudslides that killed at least 18. A spokeswoman for the multi-agency emergency response team told reporters they are hopeful that we will still recover live victims out there. An additional 900 emergency workers have arrived in Montecito, north of Los Angeles, joining the relief effort underway by more than 2,100 personnel from local, state, and federal agencies. The largest wildfire on record in California was declared contained on Friday, days after mud on the coastal mountain slopes at Scorch crashed down on homes during a storm, killing at least 18 people. The Thomas Fire was declared 100% surrounded after ravaging Ventura and Santa Barbara counties northwest of Los Angeles for more than a month. A cause has not yet been determined. Some areas of Los Padres Natural Forest remain closed to the public until authorities determine it is safe to enter. The blaze began on December 4th, when fierce winds drove the flames through tinder dry brush, chaparral, and trees. The fire blackened 440 square miles, an area nearly as large as Los Angeles. Flames whipped through foothill communities and forest wilderness. More than 1,000 buildings, including many homes, were incinerated, and thousands of people were forced to flee. Panic and confusion in Hawaii lasted more than half an hour Saturday morning after an alert was pushed to people's phones warning of an incoming ballistic missile threat. The governor said it happened when an employee pushed the wrong button during a shift change, but the false alarm sparked outrage from local politicians as it took more than half an hour to correct. Hawaii Senator Brian Schatz said he was quite angry about the incident. He also continued, we're taking a deep breath knowing that it was a false alarm but added that the mistake was totally inexcusable and the whole state had been terrified. Hawaii Senator Maisie Hirono backed up the idea on Twitter saying at a time of heightened tensions, we need to make sure all information released to the community is accurate. Military reinforcements are being ramped up in Crimea, despite last month's extension of economic sanctions on Moscow. Local media report Russia has deployed a new division of S-400 surface-to-air missiles on the peninsula, which it controversially annexed from Ukraine in 2014. 
This S-400 missile launcher allows us to locate targets in the range of up to 600 kilometers. So even when missiles reach the borders of Crimea, we'll clearly see them. The RIA news agency reports the missiles will control the airspace over the border with Ukraine. Russia claims their aim is to defend and protect the region. We've recently seen more frequent threats to our territory, including an attempted drone attack on our base in Tartus in Syria. So today's deployment of S-400 missile systems covers all the airspace over Crimea, and it makes it impossible for drones, planes, or any other flying machines here. Interfax News Agency reports the new system, known as Triumph, can be turned into combat mode in less than five minutes. The deployment is likely to escalate tensions in the region. In December, the U.S. promised to provide Ukraine with enhanced defensive capabilities, said to include Javelin anti-tank missiles. According to the chairman of the U.S. Federal Communications Commission on Saturday, the commission would be launching a full investigation into the false warning of a ballistic missile headed for Hawaii. FCC Chairman Ajit Pai posted on Twitter that the FCC was launching a full investigation, and FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel said the commission must find out what went wrong. In a post on Twitter, she wrote, Emergency alerts are meant to keep us and our families safe, not to create false panic. We must investigate and we must do better. On Saturday, Iran said it would retaliate against new sanctions imposed by the United States after President Donald Trump set an ultimatum to fix disastrous flaws in a deal curbing Tehran's nuclear program. Trump said on Friday he would waive nuclear sanctions on Iran for the last time to give the United States and European allies a final chance to amend the pact. The ultimatum puts pressure on Europeans, key backers of the 2015 nuclear deal, to satisfy Trump, who wants the pact. On Saturday, nearly a thousand anti-globalization demonstrators took to the streets in the capital of Switzerland to protest against a planned visit by Donald Trump to the World Economic Forum later this month. Last week, the U.S. president announced he would attend the forum in the city of Davos, which is an annual meeting of global business and political leaders. Some say Trump's polarizing persona could resurrect the violent anti-WEF protests from the early 2000s. An online petition has also been started saying Trump is not welcome. The Philippine Public Attorney's Office has now examined five children who died after receiving the Dengvaksha vaccine for dengue fever. The latest child, a 13-year-old boy who died in Bulacan province on January 3rd, showed massive bleeding in the brain. Dr. Erwin Erfe told the Philippine Daily Inquirer on Wednesday, January 10th, that the boy also showed blood in the scalp, heart, lungs and stomach. Erfe is director of the forensic laboratory in the Public Attorney's Office. The public attorney is looking into cases of children who died suffering from enlarged organs and severe bleeding after taking the dengue fever drug. Erfe noted the signs and symptoms occurred within six months of the last Dengvaksha injection. Erfe told TNN Philippines that the findings are still inconclusive. In early January, the Philippine Food and Drug Administration suspended the clearance for Dengvaksha. For United News International in Metro Manila, I am Crystal Yang. Street vendors had arrived early, only to find their illegal market stalls shut down. They quickly turned their anger on the security forces brought in to send them home. They'd set up shop in defiance of emergency measures that banned public gatherings and imposed a curfew. The government says marketplaces like these are breeding grounds for cholera. And while it accepts the new rules are tough, it isn't backing down. We find it extremely unacceptable that a small clique of individuals, of citizens, can decide to break the law when so many citizens have really been cooperative and have been helpful to the situation. We know that uh, we are touching on people's livelihoods, but these matters we are talking about are matters of life and death. And every responsible government must make sure that people's lives are protected at all times. The riot happened in Kanyama, a low-income township that is home to more than 350,000 people. It's one of two townships on the outskirts of the capital, Lusaka, where cholera broke out in late September. 
The disease quickly spread to the city and infected almost 3,000 people in about three and a half months. Cholera is a bacterial disease usually spread through contaminated water. Left untreated, it can kill within hours. Last week, the government deployed the army to enforce a raft of new measures to try to contain the national health crisis. Specialist cholera treatment centres closed off to the healthy. An intensive cholera vaccination campaign and a ban on public gatherings that includes funerals, church services, schools and marketplaces like this one in Lusaka. Just last week, street sellers here had pitched in to help the military close it off. Now they're opposing them. And as the impact on livelihoods grows, so too will the concern at the possibility of more civil unrest before the cholera crisis is contained. Miriam Nahond, Al Jazeera. One of the many problems in a city under siege is how to dispose of its rubbish. It's Adele Khalil's job to help collect it using a donkey and cart. The blockade of Gaza by Israel and Egypt means there are few refuse trucks and fuel's expensive. Surely there is no other country in the world using donkeys to collect rubbish. If we had proper vehicles and enough fuel, it would be faster and make our work much easier. The Gaza Strip's home to about two million people and it's almost entirely built up. So the city's waste is loaded in trucks and taken here to a giant open dump. It's one of three, all of them close to people's homes. It's enormous, it just goes on and on and it stinks. It's hard not to gag standing here. And just a few hundred meters in this direction is the separation wall built by Israel around Gaza. About a kilometer over here is the edge of the city. So there's just no other space. The municipal waste manager told us the dump emits noxious gases and liquids, and so it's a public health hazard. The authorities struggle to import machinery needed for processing or recycling because Israel restricts the imports of anything it says could be used to make weapons. <laughs> It is known all over the world that at least some of the rubbish should be recycled, but in Gaza we cannot recycle anything. We don't have any factories that could reuse the plastic or steel, so the only way to deal with it is to dump it here. But with more than 40% unemployment, there's a living to be made here too. These men search for whatever they can sell. None of them agreed to an interview. They told us they're ashamed to be seen here. The city produces nearly 2,000 tonnes of waste every day. This site will be full in about two years. And as long as the siege lasts, Gaza's dumps and its rubbish problem will only get bigger. Malcolm Webb, Al Jazeera, in the Gaza Strip. For the third straight year, Filipinos spent the most time on one of the world's largest pornography websites, Pornhub. Based on 2017 data released Wednesday, Filipinos averaged 13 minutes, 28 seconds per visit in 2017. In contrast, the global average is 9 minutes, 59 seconds. The Philippines tops the list even though the government banned Pornhub and other pornography sites last January. On average, the Filipino Pornhub visitor is 32 years old, watches porn and his smartphone and searches most often for the word benign. Pornhub says the Philippines also leads in the proportion of female to male visitors. 36% of Philippine visitors are women compared to 26% worldwide. The Philippines' three favorite porn stars are Japanese actress Maria Ozawa, Lebanese-born American social media personality Mia Khalifa, and Filipino actress Kim Domingo. For United News International in Metro Manila, I am Crystal Yang. Nearly two and a half years after the nuclear deal was signed, many Iranians say they haven't seen any real benefits and that President Hassan Rouhani promised more than he could deliver. The nuclear deal has had no impact at all in my life. The price of rice has doubled, meat is expensive, we pay millions in rent. Meanwhile, the children of officials sleep like the people don't exist. Money didn't go to my pocket or to the pocket of the woman selling things on the street or to old people. But some are still willing to stand by their president. 
Rouhani is doing his best. Of course, there are some problems in the country. Sanctions, pressure from abroad, naturally it impacts livelihoods and the economic situation. But if we just blame the president and say he is the one who has to do something, of course, he cannot. We should stand next to him, cooperate with him and tolerate the situation. The nuclear deal had some success. The lifting of sanctions let Iran sell oil again freely on the international market. Exports are up to more than two million barrels a day. But gains have been overshadowed by U.S. President Donald Trump's aggressive stance towards Iran. Every few months the Iranian nuclear deal is thrown into chaos and managing that political turmoil takes up so much of the Iranian government's time that there isn't a lot of room left for public discourse about much else. Trump has created so much uncertainty about the nuclear deal that Iranians say it's been as harmful as sanctions that the deal was meant to lift. Many people are frustrated that foreign investors are too scared to come to Iran and the value of their currency keeps falling. Trump is a person who has a psychological problem. His opinions have no balance on any issue. He's always changing his mind. And for me, as an Iranian and for most Iranians, it doesn't matter if the U.S. pulls out of the deal. As long as European countries cooperate with us, we will stay in the deal. Some Iranians don't care about the nuclear deal at all and say they simply want to get on with their lives. I just want to make people happy. That's it, and I don't care about anything else. Making people happy is a kind of art, and I'm not interested in these kinds of nuclear conversations. Iran's government says it's ready to deal with any scenario. So too, it seems, are its people. Zain Basravi, Al Jazeera, Tehran. On Saturday, ENI reported that the leader of the Islamic State's affiliate in West Africa has claimed responsibility for an attack that killed four U.S. Special Forces and four soldiers from Niger in October. The troops were killed when their joint patrol was attacked near the Mali-Niger border by dozens of militants armed with large artillery. Security officials had identified the perpetrators as Islamist militants loyal to Abdu Adnan al-Sharawi the leader of Islamic State in the Greater Sahara. President Donald Trump's administration could pursue development of new nuclear weaponry and explicitly leave open the possibility of nuclear retaliation for major non-nuclear attacks if a leaked draft policy document becomes reality. The Pentagon did not comment on the document. It prompted sharp criticism from arms control experts who voiced concerns it could raise the risks of nuclear war. The Defense Department said on Friday it did not discuss pre-decision draft copies of strategies and reviews. The Trump administration's draft document said that Obama-era assumptions of a world where nuclear weapons were less relevant proved incorrect. The world is more dangerous, not less, it said. This week, President Donald Trump created a firestorm after making comments while referring to immigration from African nations and told a group of lawmakers that the United States should have more people coming from places like Norway. The comments were made the same day Trump met with Norwegian Prime Minister Erna Solberg. Many in Norway have responded saying thanks but no thanks to what they perceive as backhanded praise from the U.S. president. On social media in Norway, people took to Twitter sharing their thoughts on the concept that Norwegians would actually want to move to the United States. According to state media and the UN Human Rights Office, Tunisian police have arrested more than 770 people since anti-austerity protests broke out this week in the North African country. Protesters face various charges, including vandalism, looting, attacks against public property, and causing fires and roadblocks. The news agency said that more than 85 percent of the people arrested are teenagers and young adults between ages 15 and 30. TAP reported that 97 police officers have been injured and 88 police vehicles damaged since protests broke this out. is the other front line of Syria's war. Far from the bombs and bullets, many Syrians now living as refugees face a daily battle for survival. We are displaced people. Look at our conditions. Countries and aid organizations have scrambled to provide a safety net for Syrian refugees. But many people are still living in camps like this one. Well, the sun might be out now, but it hasn't been enough to dry up the puddles and the wet mud brought on by the recent bad weather. And for the people living here in this camp, this is just another of the many problems that they have to deal with. It's really difficult. For now, our children are without schools. 
They couldn't resume their education after we left. We witnessed bombardment and houses destroyed, things that drive you mad. My heart is overwhelmed. The UN estimates that more than 5 million Syrians are now refugees. Rafat Shahada was a member of the Free Syrian Army in Aleppo. After getting injured, he came across the border to Turkey with his family. We are not migrants, we are displaced people. Migrants travel to work, but we are forced to leave. The Syrian people had two options, either to leave the country or die. That choice has forced many people here, a refugee camp. It means home is not so far away, but is completely unreachable. It means heartbreak. Sarah Firth, TRT World, on the Turkish Syrian border. President Donald Trump will keep the United States in the Iran nuclear deal for now. On Friday, January 12th, Trump said this is the last time he will waive nuclear sanctions against Iran. He's now calling on the U.S. Congress and its European allies to amend the deal, which he says, quote, gave Iran far too much in exchange for far too little. The clock is now ticking. A supplemental deal must be reached within 120 days or the U.S. will withdraw. Trump added, quote, no one should doubt my word. On Thursday, however, the EU's foreign policy chief maintained the deal is working to keep Iran's nuclear program in check. Iran's foreign ministry previously warned that a U.S. withdrawal would prompt a, quote, appropriate and heavy response. Iran did not immediately respond to Trump's latest statements on the nuclear deal. For United News International, I'm Matt Paul. Something to celebrate in Tunisia on the seventh anniversary of its revolution. The government has responded to anti-austerity protests, some of them violent, by announcing a multi-million euro action plan to help those most in need. The Minister of Social Affairs said the increased support will benefit some 250,000 families and would help the poor and middle class. He'll be hoping the move will calm public anger at price and tax increases in a country still plagued by deep-rooted economic problems. Hundreds have been arrested for vandalism and violence in the protests. But despite pledging a guaranteed minimum income for families living in poverty, authorities can expect more demonstrations today, including calls for an official list of those killed and wounded in the revolution, which sparked the Arab Spring. The U.S. Air Force has deployed nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers and air personnel to Guam a move that comes just a few days after North and South Korea re-established dialogue. U.S. Pacific Air Forces announced on January 9th that three B-2 bombers and 200 air personnel have been deployed to the U.S. territory. The Air Force said that these B-2s will be involved in training and exercise to ensure bomber crews maintain a high state of readiness and crew proficiency. It's unclear how long the deployment will last. The last time three of these bombers were deployed to Guam was in 2016. For United News International in Washington, D.C., I'm Caitlin Mangum. On Saturday, the White House seemed to distance itself from a mix-up that resulted in a false alert being sent out in Hawaii, warning of an imminent ballistic missile attack. As the incident unfolded, President Donald Trump was on his golf course at his Mar-a-Lago luxury resort in Florida. White House Deputy Press Secretary Lindsey Walters released a statement afterwards saying, The President has been briefed on the state of Hawaii's emergency management exercise. This was purely a state exercise. According to a report by BuzzFeed News, an official from the North American Aerospace Defense Command claimed that there was absolutely no incoming ballistic missile threat and that they were working to determine why the first alert was sent.
North Korea is denouncing a new American nuclear strategy that calls for the U.S. to enhance its arsenal of low-yield nuclear weapons. A spokesperson for the North Foreign Ministry's Institute of American Studies says the U.S. strategy is a declaration of war against the world. As part of our defense, we must modernize and rebuild our nuclear arsenal, hopefully never having to use it, but making it so strong and so powerful that it will deter any acts of aggression by any other nation or anyone else. Perhaps someday in the future, there will be a magical moment when the countries of the world will get together to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Unfortunately, we are not there yet.